Seven months to save the world, no pressure, not at all. That his age is something that makes him one of the most effective presidents we've had in a while. Uh, we see like 70 plus million people getting ready to vote for Donald Trump. NATO expansion sounds yummy. Prices are rising. Everyone will not blame Biden, but will blame Ukrainians. As a young American, are you terrified? I am terrified. Hi, and welcome to the Ukrainian Trump television. And our today's guest is Adam Mockler. Adam, hi. Thank you very much for coming. First of all, you're a star now. Uh, you've yeah. been to our show when... We were uh, there. It's like Bitcoin. We yeah, yeah. talked to you before <laughs> you were famous and stuff like that. So we get, you know... Yeah, it was like you, you had like tens of thousands of views on, on YouTube. Now it's almost like up to a million. I, I seen one of the videos and you're, you are you just signed to the Medias Touch Media, which is great. Uh, and uh, hi, thank you for coming. Uh, how's it going? Thank you for having me, man. It's going great. It's been very, very busy lately. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to dig into some Ukrainian topics and how the U.S. has completely dropped the ball lately. Every single every single congressman, mainly the Republicans, but also the Democrats are just not doing what they're supposed to. And I feel bad and I, I'm excited to chat about it. You 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 like you're doing a guy's job. Uh, the guy's work with Melania said before. Um, and you're going to this, uh, MAGA rallies and interview people there trying to argue with them, trying to, um, set their, them on some logic chain to come to some right, I don't know, uh, set them right thoughts. You've, you've educated me a lot. Uh, I appreciate that. You know, I'm just like, I would call it like just having like a normal person's conversation. Yeah. It's rarely which... the case in these. It's just like, it's like, it's not like even a discussion. It's like just a conversation, which like is full of logic, which is, you know, not that common, unfortunately, anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the question I have, you're obviously from the, you're from, uh, as I know, you're from the red state. You probably have lots of relatives who are also, uh, who also believe in a lot of lies which are spread from um, Trump camp. Um, do, you, uh, do you have the similar talks to your relatives? Are you successful in these arguments? Do you have some people you just sway to the other side? Yeah, so there's an interesting dynamic in my family where some of my family are sort of Republicans, but I also have on the other side of my family, my dad and his whole side of the family are Muslims. Are, so I, I'm in this weird spot where essentially I'm arguing with them about whether they should vote for Biden because of all that stuff going on. And I'm also arguing with people about Ukraine. So I feel like I'm squashed in the middle right now where it's like uh, two extremes basically battling it out and I'm trying to reel them both in. And it really has made me realize just how pervasive Russian disinformation is. Obviously, I knew before, but just seeing some of the new stuff that comes out and seeing some of the stuff that people say to me, you can see Vladimir Putin's fingerprints directly on these talking points. And it's really opened my mind over the past few months about this holy war that Putin is waging against the West. And something that's interesting is like Putin genuinely actually believes he needs to save the West from ourselves. He, from the bottom of his heart, he hates liberal democracy. I mean, that's obviously part of the reason he began to invade Ukraine and having to defend this stuff to Americans, to Americans that should be for democracy is really scary. And it's making me so disillusioned. But, uh, as far as the family member thing, most of them are aligned on Ukraine. A lot of my friends, I think I've kind of introduced them to the, the chain of logic, like you guys said, and why we should be supporting Ukraine. Obviously having this uh, conversation with people in the streets and uh, it sometimes be becomes really, I don't know, dangerous. Uh, I mean, uh, how does it feel? I, I, I'm feeling like, um, I don't know, threatened on this rallies where you go and interview people and trying to talk to, to them. Yeah. So I just released a video yesterday, which was my most intense video where some dude actually like grabs my mic and then the camera zooms out and there's like 15 Trump supporters around me, essentially all on his side. That was the most scared I've ever been. But we have a strategy where we go into the rally, we build rapport with people, we become friendly with a few people there and they realize, oh, this is just like a 21 year old college kid who doesn't really mean any harm. And then once we start going around, we feel a lot more comfortable because we know like that dude over there with the big white beard has our back. He, he, he knows that we're cool. So it's frightening, but in the same sense, like you guys were saying, it's just normal human conversations. A lot of these people are humans and a lot of people on our side, on like the liberal side, think that all 
Trump voters are too far gone, but that's 74 million Americans that they're writing off. So my whole philosophy is if I can go into these rallies and not even change their vote, but just introduce them to new fact patterns that they otherwise wouldn't hear, they've never heard before. So with that, I change when I changed that dude's mind on Ukraine, I don't think he had ever heard any of those arguments before in his life. So it's not like he's going to go home and be some huge Ukraine supporter, but at least he's thinking about it now. And he understands that, hey, this is maybe how you put America first. And like the entire world order first. You see, this is something that you're like gravitating towards what we were talking about earlier before the recording started. Um, so, um, you know, whenever I watch one of your videos, it's like you apply this like soft logic and people gradually, they agree with you and it takes a couple of minutes. And then, you know, they come to the conclusion that, you know, well, it's not as horrible as we painted it to be. Yeah. They don't become Ukraine supporters immediately, but they, agree with you on like, oh yeah, actually helping Ukraine is in the US interest, for instance. Does it feel though, sometimes that it's as easy, if it's so easy, quote unquote, for you to persuade them about a right thing, that you know, then later on, somebody else can convince them with the same ease of something else. And then essentially, some of your work may be, uh, I'm afraid to say maybe futile, does that does encourage you in any way? Or Am I wrong in my assumption? Do, do these things like make lasting impact? You're right in your assumption, but it hasn't disillusioned me yet. But it almost does feel like a Sisyphus type battle where I'm pushing a boulder up a hill. And every time I almost get there, it rolls back down. And it's like, well, now I have to restart. But like I said, it's more about just introducing them to new ideas rather than completely changing their vote. So I count it as a win every time some Trump supporter is like, oh, you've actually educated me on that topic. Or, oh, I've never thought of it like that. And I think, I think if there's a ton of people around the country doing what I'm doing on a large scale, a ton of like-minded people basically putting their skills together to keep on doing this, keep on hammering home the points, I think it will become effective eventually. I mean, democracy is built off conversation. Democracy is built off talking to people and trying to come to a middle ground. And another layer to it is that like, after I have the conversation and I post it online, it'll get like a few million views on TikTok or whatever. And I hope that's another layer of maybe somebody my age who doesn't really know much about the war is scrolling through TikTok and they see me talking to a Trump supporter and they learn a few talking points. They know how to talk to their dad about it now, or they know how to talk to their friend who is a MAGA supporter. And that's also something that I kind of hope to do is building this platform to teach people how to have these conversations. Yeah, that's that's actually a great idea. And you mentioned TikTok and other media. I like if I was a communication specialist in some, I don't know, presidential campaign or whatever, and I've got a task to, you know, like spread a message, like spread some message, do some uh, of this work. I would be lost completely in today's media environment. And I'm like, how do you even do that now? There's Twitter where Elon Musk essentially moderates it. There's uh, TikTok where there's Chinese algorithm, which does, you know, like nobody knows what. There's Facebook where politics is banned already and Instagram where politics gets you banned. Uh, how, like, how do you deliver a message to people um, in this environment, uh, what do you, what, what do you think people should do to do that? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head with the fact that Twitter is run by Elon and he's allowing Russian information to run rampant. He actually boosts Russian information actively. Um, we talked about this last time. You have U.S. politicians, Vivek Ramaswamy, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the big guy himself, Donald Trump, essentially spouting off Russian talking points about pulling us out of NATO. And again, TikTok, which is run by ByteDance, which is directly run by the CCP. So they're definitely all of these all of these foreign adversaries are essentially putting their thumb on the scale of this American election and they're trying to sway it in any way they can. So again, it's a huge uphill battle. How can we combat this misinformation or disinformation effectively? And one piece of it is that Biden is a little bit too old to communicate effectively or to be a really powerful speaker. Um, and I think we just need to have Democrats firing on all cylinders, pulling no punches at all. We need a strong Democratic Party that is not afraid to pull any punches towards the Republicans, especially people like Mike Johnson, who are actively costing Ukrainian lives by holding up aid. I think we need to be calling these people out for being the Russian stooges they are effectively. And I think we need to have younger people like me as a mouthpiece for the administration, because some of the comments I get are like, Honestly, I've ne like a comment I got on TikTok the other day was, why does this kid explain it better than most people in the Democratic Party? Which tells 
you that there is a huge failure in messaging in the Democratic Party. Has anybody that's a Democrat explained that we're not just sending cash bags to Ukraine. We're actually mostly sending military equipment that we can restock and repile. I don't know how many Democratic politicians I've heard give that talking point. So that leads to Republicans dominating the narrative, driving the entire narrative. Oh, we're sending taxpayer dollars to Ukraine. Ukraine is a Nazi run state and Russia has every right to take over. So I really think it's just about this is just a vague answer, but stronger messaging, more powerful leaders in the Democratic Party that aren't afraid to pull punches and use the same tactics that Republicans use, because Republicans are not afraid to get dirty, are not afraid to slander people. And I, I think we shouldn't go as far as they do, but there is something to be said about the fact that they are driving the entire narr narrative in America right now. It is, in fact, very difficult to fight against Republicans on the field that they are so good at, namely, you know, just be being vocal about any, like, it seems to me sometimes that the Democrats are, like, scared to tell the truth because it's not as provocative as some of the lies that, you know, just being spewed by the MAGA crowd. But whenever they try to, like, battle with them with the same methods, it doesn't work because Democrats are not that good at making up crap. So, I mean, it's just a, it's a little side note, but what's, what's uh, interesting to me is that I recently came back from the United States, actually, I've been there for like good two weeks. Um, and a thing that was most interesting to me is that a lot of people, uh, especially like older, hardcore Democrats, they get offended at a concept that, you know, Biden's too old for some messages or that Biden doesn't get it or something. But from from your viewpoint, is is the age thing really um, that um, kind of destructive to the, to the whole cause, or is it just something that the MAGA will use as an argument to undermine him? His age has actually led to him having so much experience in Washington, so much know-how and how to reach across the aisle, that his age is something that makes him one of the most effective presidents we've had in a while. He's even more effective than President Obama because he has passed these massive bills where he gets Republicans to sign on. There's a bipartisan infrastructure bill where he got 19 Republicans to sign on. So his experience in Washington, his age, to me, is actually one of the reasons I really like him. It makes him effective. But I will say, optically... It's just so easy to to attack him on. So the State of the Union, I don't know if you guys watched that, probably clips, and he absolutely killed it. He did a great job. He stood up for Ukraine a lot, but then he had one or two slip ups in his speech, and that is what got distributed among Republicans on social media. So again, I keep using this phrase, but it's just an uphill battle with Biden's age where it makes him so effective. It makes him really respectable and even like Republicans in Congress respect him. People like Lindsey Graham, who are terrible, like terrible people. They even say Biden's a great guy. He's fundamentally better than Donald Trump, but it's optically just such a loser that I don't know how we get past it without just, we just need to have Biden out there talking more and more, because if you watch a Biden speech, then you watch a Trump speech. It's very clear who the better guy is. It's very clear who the better talker is, who's more coherent in his speech. But I also think to go back to Russian disinformation, they probably help boost these clips of Biden stumbling, Biden messing up because they want Trump to be back in office. So you, you mentioned Mike Johnson and you mentioned that um, like Democrats should be more willing to call them Russian stooges, what, which they are. And uh, Donald Trump obviously holds pro-Russian position, more pro-Russian position than any American politician right now. Um, do, like, and uh, from our perspective, uh, we see like 70 plus million people r getting ready to vote for Donald Trump, even though he's pro-Russian, I don't know, pro-Chinese, um, in, in his essence, pro everything bad. <laughs> and we're like, uh, is it that bad? Uh, I mean, you're obviously not, you're, you're talking not only to people on mega rallies and I know like I'm not asking about mega rallies, but do, do like half American voters believe this, believe like that stuff which he's telling what what's going on with you what's what's wrong i think they just need it explained to them so at a fundamental level all of these people all these republicans keep using this phrase america first we need to put america first and i explained like in that clip this is exactly how we put america first so these people have essentially been misled into voting against their own interests and crippling the global order that we've built over the past few decades with nato and it's just such a, it sounds like a cop out, but again, if Russian disinformation is so pervasive that it's struck the entire Republican party, it's convinced them that NATO is this expansionary state that goes and takes over countries.
countries. They've con they're convinced that NATO provoked this war. I mean, I was talking to a Republican the other day. They were like, NATO just exists to stop Russia. It's like, it's bad. It exists to contain Russia, but contain Russia from doing what? Invading countries in Europe? Like that is, that is why NATO exists. To act like containing Russia is a bad thing is just scary. So all of these Americans have been psyop into thinking that NATO and to thinking that Ukraine are not our allies. And I think it's a really scary position that we found ourselves in. And a lot of people just get their news straight from the social medias that we were talking about. So it's so easy for them to get all of these Russian talking points in their head. They're always asking me, oh, what about when Gorbachev and uh, what's his name? James Baker didn't want to go one inch east or whatever. Like, that's not a real thing. That is straight from the Kremlin. Again, it's not real. Why do you, why do you peddle these talking points that are straight from the because Kremlin? Because American politicians are peddling this. Like, I mean, like literal American congressmen and senators are spreading Russian, like Russian propaganda straight out of Russia, just without even like changing the words. I don't know with uh, Google translating tasty. Russian. It's really tasty. It's like yeah, these it is. tasty it is. phrases. It's like it's like it's an easy way out. You know who's at fault? NATO expansion sounds yummy. Like it's we don't we shouldn't you know dig any deeper into these like historical inaccuracies and and years of of uh, you know invasions and murders because that's so difficult. Like let's just make it easy. You know NATO expansion. And people, a lot of people, especially a lot of people, I have to say like like both on the far right and far left but also some of the more like central one they like to believe they have this like uh, belief that you know somehow us is at fault for many things so it must be at fault here as well and it's easy to blame the big and strong guy so it's it's like this self flagellation if you will which is sometimes useful but i mean definitely not in this case and and not, definitely not as an argument uh, as to you know why uh, why to not or to help ukraine another thing that is uh, in, i'm interested in especially since you're a very involved young person in america uh for the past two days here in ukraine we have been discussing a an article from financial times which came out i think a day before mark or something yeah about that their uh sources financial times sources uh have stated that they were asking ukrainian officials not to strike russian um oil refinery uh, oil refineries and other energy uh, uh manufacturing places uh so as not to drive the oil price up um I mean, it's, it's, it's at this point, unfortunately, a very believable thing to say, but also it's kind of really, really bad since not only does the West not help Ukraine to the extent that we need it, but also they deny us the right to actually influence our adversary in a way that actually cripples them both financially and militarily. So do you have an opinion on that thing? Why does it, why does it happen? You think, or do you think maybe, cause there have been talks that this is just a hoax. This is just fake news, uh, you know, spread, especially to kind of further this divide between Americans and Ukrainians, you know? Uh, so, so what do you think happened? Maybe you have some sort of insight and what does it look like to an American? I read that article and I think Democrats are sort of cowards for doing that. I think all American politicians are becoming cowards on Ukraine. We need to go gloves off. It is absolutely terrifying me that Russia is doing what they're doing, that we're costing lives. But to explain it from an American perspective, I think this is, I don't fully agree with this, but as the oil prices are rising, gas prices in America obviously rise. And the one indicator that the average American has every single day to the economy are the gas signs that they drive by on the way to work or the way to school. So if you're seeing these gas prices actively rise, you're going to begin to gain or blame the president. And when we're about six or seven months away from one of the most important elections ever, it's a very real fear that, as Mark was explaining before the call, Putin could pull the plug on a lot of this oil and essentially cripple American the American economy or just cripple our gas prices by raising them a bunch. And this could also just be a larger game to get Trump back into office. So if you can imagine a reality where gas prices do shoot up to like $4 from what, two fifty now, a lot of Americans who don't really know better would uh, immediately blame President Biden. They drive past it on the way to work. They go, oh my God, that's a lot of money. And that would, again, just increase Trump's chances of getting into office, of pulling us out of NATO, of crippling these relationships with other allies. So it is kind of a weird position because 
striking oil refineries is a great form of resistance. It's a way better form of any other form of resistance. It's way better than the other forms of resistance we've seen these past few months. I think it's absolutely valid, but it puts Biden in a really tight spot where it's like, will Vladimir Putin tank the U.S. election? Because I'm sure he would love to. He would love to put his thumb on the scale and make sure that Trump gets back into office. So it is this it's this weird game where I think it was kind of cowardly to tell uh, Ukrainians to stop doing that. But from a broader perspective, I do kind of understand where they're coming from, even if I disagree with it. And thanks God, after this uh, article, everyone will not bl blame Biden, but will blame Ukrainians. <laughs> this is just another thing we are needing right now. You can't win. You can't win, Mark. Yeah. This channel, by the way, which you should uh, subscribe to, comment and share this video, talk. Again, as we said to you last time, please, if you disagree with us, if disagree with Adam, disagree with Mark, disagree, please complain in the comments as much as possible. We love you your opinions we love insults. and we'll and we'll try to to respond to them to every single one so please the longer your comment the more the Excited better we, we understand are. we're wrong <laughs> so yeah please do that so yeah but coming back to the thing it's like it's like you can't win then it just it seems you can't win like as a ukrainian because we're so inconvenient for everyone. Like whatever we do to preserve our sovereignty and security, well, that influences a whole bunch of other stuff. And then I guess the only thing that matters here in order to avoid the situation where gas prices rise up and in order to stop Ukraine from striking oil refineries in Russia is actually giving Ukraine weapons to do it on the battlefield. But apparently that is impossible. By the way, Adam, is it impossible? No, it shouldn't be impossible. I think... Uh, so the way American politics has been working lately is we've got a sort of a border crisis, as Republicans call it. There's, of course, a problem with the border. And Democrats wanted to pass this bill where they combine funding with the border, funding with Ukraine, funding with Israel, all of it together. Republicans shot it down because of Donald Trump. So now they're proposing a standalone bill for all of these things. They have a standalone bill for Ukraine funding. But what Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, is essentially doing is dangling it in front of Congress like keys or dang it, dangling in front of you guys like a set of keys without actually passing it, which I think is almost even more evil. It's almost worse. Just pass the damn bill. It scares me. And uh, yeah, we had definitely have a broken system. And I've said I've used this analogy before, but Vladimir Putin's fingerprints are all over the way America, American Congress is working right now. It's so dysfunctional and so divided. And Vladimir Putin loves that. He loves that he was able to split the American people into different sides. And he wants to provoke the far left and the far right, or just the Republicans in general, in the same exact way, by spreading extreme anti-Semitism, by spreading misogyny, by spreading even Islamophobia, any sort of hate he can spread in America to divide us helps him out. And I think that reflects in Congress, because Congress is essentially elected by the people, of course. So when Americans are divided 50-50, you'll see that reflected in Congress. Now, Congress is divided 50-50, and we genuinely can't do anything. And I think another point is now that like Finland and Sweden have joined NATO makes you realize that Vladimir Putin may be the best advocate for NATO there is more so than any American politician. Like he's made NATO into a more cohesive allegiance than they have been in the past few decades, ever since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. People were actually Absolutely. forgetting why we needed NATO. And now we remember why we need NATO. I mean, you mentioned Russian influence a lot. And uh, this, this is something which frustrates us a lot as Ukrainians, because we've been there. To be honest, uh, like maybe before 2012, 2010, uh, most of Ukrainians or maybe half of Ukrainians didn't believe in Russian influence. So they didn't like thought that it's just our own thing. It's just our own thing. And then, um, as, as like as we go further, we uncover that, okay, we had this, this minister who was the agent of Russia, this minister who was working for FSB, this, uh, like president who had deals with, with the, with Russian money, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, I mean, like, we were ignorant at some point, even though we were really close to Russia, but in the United States, we right now, from the Ukrainian perspective, we see so much of Russian influence. We see so much of, uh, probably Russian money or Russian something else. I don't like, I don't even know what it is. Um, nobody tries to uncover it most of the time. Uh, but so much like pro Russian stances, pro Russian position doesn't come out of nowhere. And, um, 
But it feels like Americans are not like buying it. I, I mean, like when you say someone is pro-Russian who's like bought by Russia or something like that, who's like useful idiot for Russia, I don't feel like Americans are buying this argument. They are trying to like, it's not, it's impossible. How could Russia meddle with us? How could Russia like do such stuff with such a powerful superpower, um, American empire, whatever. But there, there he is. And, and uh, yeah, do, do you think this argument is working or will ever work? Uh, one of the most potent examples of what you're talking about is that recently a guy named Alexander Smirnov was one of the Republicans' key witnesses for this Hunter Biden case about Hunter Biden uh, and Joe Biden essentially colluding with Ukraine or or taking money from Ukraine. And it came out that this Alexander Smirnov guy got all of his intelligence from a Russian official. He's directly a Russian stooge, but Republicans still continue to peddle this lie. Someone put together a compilation of them saying, this is our key witness. This is our star witness. This guy is our kill shot. And he brings the whole case. And then after it came out that he's a Russian stooge, they started saying, no, we didn't even know who this guy was. We didn't even care about him. Like, who's Alexander Smirnov? So they just have a way to deflect and turn at every single corner. But I do think once people start to open their eyes to this Russian propaganda, you see it everywhere. And I'm going to spend every single day from now until the election trying to call this out. But like, the more you look for it, the more you start to see these bots and comments saying stuff over and over the same exact comment three times in a row. You start to see these talking points that you find out originated from the Kremlin being spewed by American politicians. So I think this is something that people underestimate at the moment, Democrats and Republicans alike. Nobody realizes quite how bad it is. No, like Vladimir Putin knows that what's cheaper than launching a ground invasion is to divide the American people. There's a phrase that's kind of corny, united we stand, divided we fall. And right now we are more divided than ever. Uh, Vladimir Putin in 2016 and 2015, they were boosting two candidates. And that was Donald Trump, and Bernie Sanders, the two most extreme candidates there were running at the time, they were trying to boost those, signal boost their messages so that the American people would divide themselves into these different cliques. And I think democratic politicians need to take control of the narrative. Like I've said, they need to start calling out this Russian misinformation, disinformation for what it is. Again, I don't even know if I can think of an example of any democratic politician going up there and just calling it out, literally just saying these people are pro-Russia. That is a Russian talking point. We are going to cripple the world order that we've built. I don't know. I don't know. Like eventually someday if I have a bigger and bigger audience and I'm able to able to actually, my message is able to reach the average American. That's all I'm going to talk about is that we need to stop Russian interference. Yeah, it's just like we're used to making fun of things at our channel, but lately, lately it has been uh, progressively more difficult to make jokes. Um, it's it just the last thing I want to ask you, uh, just, you know, a relatable kind of thing, because uh, we're like running out of time at this point. But as a young American, are you terrified yet or, <laughs> or are you still not? Because I'm terrified. I've spent the last few months, even more so than the last time we talked, absolutely terrified, especially at what I see on the ground in America with People my age, I won't get too much into it, but there are people my age who have been so sucked up by the TikTok algorithm that they want Donald Trump to win despite being liberal because they believe in this accelerationist theory where if Donald Trump wins, he'll cripple our institutions. And that's good. America is a is a, an empire that needs to be crippled. And then you have people on the far right mirroring that same isolationist rhetoric. And sometimes you can point to a lot of examples of America meddling in other countries when they shouldn't have. But this is not one of those examples. So I am absolutely terrified. Again, once I started really paying attention to all the Russian disinformation that's out there, I realized it is everywhere. I even have family members who will casually say something who are liberals. And I'm like, that's not quite true. That is genuinely Russian propaganda. And I think we should all be terrified. And I hope someday I get to be a sort of megaphone for my generation. I hope I get to because right now, a lot of my followers and fans tend to be, if you look at my analytics, they're all like 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old. I'm not quite breaking through to my generation yet. But the second I do, I'm going to start telling them, you guys have been duped by Russian inf disinformation. And I hope that uh, ByteDance is forced to sell TikTok to an American subsidiary so that the CCP can stop having direct control over 170 million Americans who use TikTok and 50 to 100 million Americans who use X. Elon Musk's owned X. 
So to answer your question, I am terrified. I think we should all be. I'm getting increasingly more terrified by the day. I'm getting terrified for you guys. I feel terrible that America's dropped the ball like this. Our politicians are too much of cowards to just send you guys the weapons that you need. And I hope that we're able to fix it. But on a, on a solid note, I mean, Vladimir Putin did say he would be to Kiev in three days. And what was that, two years ago now? So that's a win. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It takes some time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, 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 the Americans, uh, do the Americans who are feeling this way as well, um, there are a couple of lessons from Ukrainians. We've been um, to the worst places we could be. And um, we've, been, we've been through revolutions. We've been through dictatorships, uh, through... Uh, rigged elections against um, against democratic leaders, and uh, yeah, the only the only thing you should you should do is act. You, like don't don't sit at home. Stop like stop thinking that some uh, I don't know Biden campaign pouring millions dollar millions of dollars into commercials will solve your problems. No, go out and talk to your relatives, talk to like campaign, um, organize, do do stuff. Get elected. Uh, get elected God yeah sake. yeah yeah go Please to politics go go yeah. to politics this is this is a lesson we in ukraine haven't learned yet <laughs> mostly uh but uh yeah get up there and and do something because if you don't like it's not like there is a lesson yeah, we've from been russia places. it's not pretty there it's not okay. pretty like you, it's gonna be bloody if you don't like if you don't stop it before it comes and uh, there's the russian lessons as well um they couldn't do anything like it's, it's just locked in at some point and that's it. The, that's, that's the end of it. And there's no path like uh, to the other side or Hungary or take any country which like go into dictatorship. Uh, it doesn't like, you can't, you cannot negotiate with that anymore. You, you just, just doesn't, ha yeah. you, you don't have any, anything anymore. So yeah, go out there, do, do anything possible. It's like seven months, um, not a Seven lot of time. months to save the world. No pressure. Yep, not yep. at all. <laughs> yep. Yep. Do, do something. Yeah. One final thing is that a lot of people think that Donald Trump would turn the US into a Russia type country. But the model that he's actually going for is the Viktor Orban model in Hungary, where he slowly starts to erode these norms. He appoints civil servants under him. Like he has a plan to appoint all of these loyalists in key positions in the government. He wants to have the DOJ, the FBI, all of these institutions working at his control, doing what he wants. And then eventually, as these court orders start to come in from the Supreme Court that say, hey, you can't do this, can't do that, Donald Trump will start to ignore those court orders. And then the Supreme Court starts to curtail its behavior to fit the president of the United States. Then we're hungry. Then we're literally the hungry model has come to life in America. Yeah, and uh, if you don't know, we had a great interview uh, with Sabol Spani, uh, the journalist from Hungary, who told us everything about um, how did Orban manage to do that in Hungary. Go watch it; it's it's great and uh, and also terrifying because it's goddamn smart. Um, they they what they did they essentially killed the free media because they killed the um, the their business uh, by killing off the. Um, like ads market. And, um, and after that, they installed their own media. And now you, you cannot break through that. That's it. Yeah, That's and Shabolch did, did not like it. He did not like the he hungry not like that. It. It, yeah. So like you go watch that. Go watch our videos. Go watch Adam's videos. We're going to leave his channel in the video description. I mean, he doesn't need our help at this point, but we're just going to be nice and be <laughs> like, yeah, sure. Okay. We're going to promote your huge ass channel on our tiny little channel. Also, yeah, we can celebrate. It was 30,000 subscribers on our little channel last week. Yay. So, yay. <laughs> Maybe we should start doing TikToks. Anyway. Yeah. We thank should. you, Adam. <laughs> thank you, Adam. Thank you guys for watching and we will see you next week. Hopefully. Thanks for having me. Thank you.